Okay, so today what we are going to do basically we are uh, again looking at sample application. The, the total class is mostly dedicated to actually designing a data model for this application. Okay, and then we look at some sample code snippets of how do you create and how does it work and etc. Because we will use some of these code snippets in our uh, last class when we are building the application in com in, in, in in totality. Okay, in totality. So what are we going to do today? So we basically look at all the so we, we we talked about a general hotel application, right? Hotel booking application. So we look at base the basic requirements of uh, hotel application, and then we will uh, try and design it using RDBMS, and then we'll try to design the same thing using the Cassandra style, and then we look at the multiple flavors. In sense, like you actually can optimize that model than what is actually being designed at the first level. That is the idea is basically when you are looking at uh, things you might actually think it still a little closer to the RDBMS world and then how we can refine it to a more efficient model. Then we have a few small quick install tips. I think that's something which you guys have already familiar with because few of them already installed and working with it so that may be more of a repetition for you guys. For a set of people who didn't were not able to install we could just rush through that in install guide. Uh, the configuration, client tools and then uh, uh, there are a few working with Cassandra, more to do with uh, some of the important uh, column family specific properties that you would be able to set and we'll talk about all those things. Then uh, we'll look at a set of uh, a basic uh, uh, actual coding application as to how do you actually define the storage. When you define your storage for a specific table, what is the right way and how is it suitable uh, depending upon the usage of the query. Right, so whereas there are several ways, uh, as we say, Cassandra is more of a query-based modeling system. So your data model is in line with, is mostly, uh, is done in line with the most frequently used queries in your application. So that's it's a query-based modeling system. So we'll talk about uh, how do you actually uh, create the data in the database. How do you structure your table, which is probably makes it more suitable to your queries and uh, etc. Okay, so this is basically what we are talking about as an application. So this is a simple hotel search application where you can, there are actually multiple input parameters, right? One is where you are going to, a particular city where you are going to, the check-in and check-out times, uh, check-in and check-out dates basically, the rooms, a number of adults and children who would be staying in that room, and then yeah, you want flight and car is another set of things which are available in any travel site, but Let's not worry about the flight and car here. We'll just say basic hotel room dis hotel room reservation is what you're doing. Okay. So what are the input search parameters? As I said, destination name, dates, rooms, adults, number of adults, and number of children. Okay. And what will be the output? All the available hotels and their prices. Right. And this should be a very familiar application for everyone, right? So this is basically what the hotel listing will come to. So it will show you information about the hotel, uh, a basic image or a short image of how does the hotel look probably of the outer uh, outer view of the hotel in a sense because uh, that's showed you one of the attracting feature. So if you have really a very big five star hotel and they want to put their uh, uh, photograph in front just to make people get attracted to it. So that's one is an image and then the star rating basically the what, what star it is, five star, four star, three star. Etc. And then uh, there is a review rating, basically talking about how the how the reviews are. Uh, did every did people give uh, very good reviews or they've given bad reviews? Uh, all the reviews, and the review count, the number of reviews which are there actually out of which the rating has been given, average rating and things like that. So then the the price average per night, and then the description. So always it gives if you look at it right, it says average per night the price, right? It doesn't tell you the exact price any time in the listings because uh, that is actually the eventually consistent price model. Okay, only when you do the actual booking, that's when you'll see the absolute price. Okay, so these are the set of things that would show in a general hotel listing when you are searching for a, a hotel in a specific city. Okay. So coming to the next level, now the, the, the DSA for example you have selected a hotel, okay, say so here, here in our case we said we have selected Vivanta by Taj. So Vivanta by Taj is, is selected and then uh, you see that uh, there are, you need additional details, right, all the additional details associated with that hotel will be shown up. 
the photos of the various types of rooms, the various types of rooms available, the flexibility dates, the uh, basically the I mean some uh, hotel specific restrictions on check-in check-out, uh, so basic basically points of interest near the hotel, reviews rates, re policies, any specific check-in check-out policies as we said, then address associated with the hotel, the various types of rooms that are there in the hotel, the various facilities that are provided in each of the hotel rooms, all those information would be shown as part of the hotel details. Okay. So we are talking about an application which has basically first level is uh, it, it's, it's able to take your inputs, search parameters, provide you a result of a set of hotels which gives you very high level information about it, some rating, some star, star rating, average price per night and etc. And then it gives, once you click on that, it gives you additional details about the hotel, amenities, points of interest, etc. Et okay. So assume that this is a simple application that we are building. So let's look at what are the requirements, basic requirements of such an application. Okay. So defining uh, the requirements, right? So there are two types of requirements that every application will have. Say so something called functional and non-functional. Uh, functionally, we have said that it's basically it should be able to search hotels. Simple enough, right? So I'll give you uh, dates and I'll give a particular city as a destination and I'll have to be able to search for a list of hotels. Then it, it should display all the hotels listed, listings of the hotels, display the details of the hotel should be able to shop for next 365 days because most often than not you should be able you should be booking your hotels in advance which means that I should be able to book my hotel for the next one year. Then uh, should be able to support multiple languages because we're talking about uh, a, a hotel booking application which is an international application because basically if I'm traveling abroad or rather uh, say to a different country I should be able to book a hotel in that particular country. right? So and then uh, people could be from different language backgrounds so they should be able to use their local language portal to do the booking so that's the reason it should be able to support multiple languages uh, it should be able to support multiple point of sale so it's like uh, uh, so like for example jet airways tickets could be sold by uh, a clear clear trip or probably make my trip. There are people, multiple people who actually sell it. So it should be able to be, it should be able to sell tickets from multiple points of sales. Book for multiple days for sure, many days at the same time. Should be able to store prices with parameters. It's basically again these parameters are actually could be based on uh, control of the prices. Say for example, if somebody is actually coming with uh, a specialized discount token, so his price should be automatically varied appropriately or probably somebody is a more regular visitor so because of which the hotel has uh, provided some uh, uh, some additional discount so it could be some of those things so there should be some parameters associated with the prices so that they could be controlled when you're actually doing the billing to it then uh, should be able to store for multiple room types I mean these are just like uh, trying to put requirements around the hotels application right these are more of a functional requirements now when it comes to the non-functional side, right, you have, it has to be highly available naturally because we are talking about a hotel application which is across the world, used across the world. Elastic scale naturally should be able to add information as required, so which means it should be able to scale very easily. So more number of hotels coming into picture, more cities getting added, automatically more amount of data gets into it and uh, so you should be able to scale very easily, right. Big data needs, absolutely, big data, eventual and strong consistency. So very important thing if you look at it, right? So as I said, uh, in one case where we have uh, prices to be shown, the prices are actually on an average basis, which means that it is not really consistent or proper price at the time, at the time of search. So it, it needs eventual consistency to support that. And then at the same time, it needs strong consistency when you're actually up, uh, really booking the appropriate hotel. So once you book it, then that shouldn't change. At the time of booking, it should give you a fixed price, and that fix that price is applied when the actually when the person actually checks in and uses the hotel for stay. So it needs both eventual and strong consistency. Then fault tolerant naturally, if, uh, it should never be a situation that somebody is trying to book a hotel and then say, "Sorry, the server is not available after some time." It should be low latency because it should be immediately able to respond back to him. 
it should never be a situation that it will just take uh, its own sweet time to come back and say, okay, sorry, your, your hotel is not available, whatever. High traffic volumes, a huge amount of storage. So these are some of the non-functional requirements for this kind of an application. So now what will be what we try, try and do is we try to build an RDBMS model. Okay. So just uh, the one which is shown uh, is an RDBMS uh, database model for such kind of an application. I mean, it's, let's take a little time on this one just to understand how this actually fits into the application. So I mean, it's, it's not absolutely correct and it, is, it doesn't take care of everything. It, the idea is basically to give a concept. Okay. So it's, it's, it's absolutely not perfect in any sense. So please don't try to uh, actually question the correctness of the model in a sense. The idea is yeah, how it will be built. Okay. It's basically get to the how it will be built and how it will be if you really build a data model for such kind of an application. What, how does it look in an RDBMS world, right? So we, we, as our RDBMS says, we always talk about entities, right? So any entity will actually become a table by itself with its properties and then there is a relation, relational table which sort of uh, combines them uh, into uh, something more of a, a intermediary relation table types. Uh, so then in this case, like you have, CT could be actually be a, a what do you say, an entity by itself. But we showed one one table called hotels by city. And then there is a room, which is another entity. Reservation is another entity. Guest, point of interest. And uh, hotels to point of interest has to be relational. So the, the relation ho table called hotel to POI. Room to amenity. There is the room and there is an amenity and then there is a room to amenity relationship. Okay, so, so there are multiple basically entities and relationships together becomes tables and they are actually connected by the foreign key model. Okay. So this is exactly what we would do when you're actually building a model in RDBMS. Right. So this is a, a general RDBMS uh, model that we would build for an application like this. So the, the, the concept is we, we try to reduce the duplications by trying to create those uh, foreign key relationships where it could actually be queried comfortably saying using where hotel ID equal to obtain all my point of interest information. So you could do a relational or a join between the tables and then you should be able to query, right? So what happens exactly is this one. So whenever I say select star from hotel, where hotel ID in a so and so table, it will sort of do some joins of the tables and then uh, it does uh, obtain the data and then does some sort of application merge and then gives you the result. It could actually be a materialized view which actually does the aggregation for you and uh, sends the results out. So something like that. A, a materialized view is not something it could be created or it could be available or it, in a way it will get it will be formed after a couple of joins and then um, application merge and sort of creates a result out of it. Right? Okay, so now challenges. What are the challenges with such a such a model? If I do with RDBMS, what happens? If uh, in our application, right, in our hotel application, we know that we have to add, keep on adding new fields and new features, which automatically means the schema should be varied. So I keep on adding, uh, changing my schema continuously is, uh, is is absolutely a pain. And changing schema at least in RDBMS level actually puts a lot of onus on the application, and application has to change it queries appropriately to accommodate the new changes, the new fields, as well as your code, which actually handles some of those results. Uh, so all those things have to be changed, which is a very, very huge challenge in the RDBMS world. And since the data is growing very rapidly with new cities, new hotels, new facilities getting added, accommodating such kind of change is very, very tough. It involves DB changes, application changes, and then you it automatically means more application changes automatically means more regression and more regression and more changes automatically mean more time and more cost and absolutely finally a lost opportunity. Right? So if you cannot really adjust to those changes at a much faster pace, uh, it would take more time to publish your new features in the market. So assume that you have actually brought out a, a jacuzzi in your hotel and you want to really advertise it and provide people uh, as a capability to be able to reserve. Uh, 
that through the site, but because of your uh, time that you take to actually make sure that the application is changed, new version of the application has to be released after regression and etc. If it takes longer time, then uh, you might have lost an opportunity. If somebody is looking for a jacuzzi in that, say, it takes about a month for you to get, every, or rather, if you say even if it is 15 days, you'd get those changes in. But if those 15 days uh, actually might cost you a lost opportunity for sure. Okay. So for see these kind of uh, situations where you're talking about uh, uh, constantly changing stuff, where you want to change prices, you add new fields, new features, uh, where it involves a lot of uh, variable schema kind of a model, uh, it becomes RDBMS becomes really really tedious to manage and uh, maintain. Okay. So coming back to what are the different types of queries that this application would run, right? So looking at what we have seen so far, it will basically says get all hotel IDs by destination or city name. That was for the first query. Basically, I selected a city, I have selected uh, my dates, and then I say, okay, show me all hotels in the city. Okay. Then uh, the next section is assume that I have all got my hotels which are available. Then the next query will be get all hotel availability by hotel IDs, which means that uh, say I'll pass my hotel ID collection and say which of these hotels are actually available for booking, right? Then uh, assume that you have actually selected a hotel, then you want to know the hotel details by the hotel ID. So you selected hotel ID, you pass it to uh, another query and say, give me all the details for say Taj Vivanta in our case, right? So similarly, you should have, be, have a capability to update hotels. Basically, you should be able to add new details, new facilities in the hotels at any time. You should be able to update rooms and rates and availability, okay? Because some particular room is booked, so you have to mark it as not available. So the availability and rooms, room rates are actually increasing. So assume that the demand is actually increased a lot because of some particular event that's happening in the region, so you want to really increase the rates. Absolutely right, so you should be able to update it. Get all hotels for different point of sale. Get all hotels for different language, I mean in different language rather, I would say. Okay, so these are all the things which are actually the queries which are supposed to be supported by this application, right? These are not complete set of queries, most important thing, right? It's not the entire set of queries that you would run on the application because uh, whenever you are actually talking about building an application, uh, would you be knowing all possible queries beforehand? So you wouldn't be knowing all possible queries at upfront before you design the application because there will be some of them we actually you figure it out along the way, right? While building it, so you will know, but you would store surely know what is the basic functionality that you're trying to achieve. Which means that you will know all the most common or the most important queries that you would be running to actually build an application from on storage system, right? So you'll surely know what are the most important queries. So list out all the most important queries. Uh, so so identify all the most important queries that the application would run because at the first step and then try to rate those queries in a sense like say for example in our case we, which are the ones which are the maximum used queries out of this hotels ID by destination or city name will be done by every user who actually logs into the portal right uh, then uh, get all hotel availability by hotel IDs it depends on actually uh, this is also another one which is run by every user on who, who logs into the portal, portal. Get hotels details by hotel ID. It will be again depending on the selected hotel. You probably select one of the hotels and you will get details about only that particular hotel. And if you don't select and you are just browsing across for different destiny, different dates and uh, availability and etc. You may not hit this hotel till somebody selects it, the, query, the third query. So if you look at it, what I'm trying to say is there are some of the queries in your entire set which will be identified as the most frequently or used or mostly used and some of the queries which will probably be at least or less less frequently used. So you should categorize that information when you're actually building a query based model. Okay? So identify that when you're actually built your most common queries and then you actually appropriately model it. Now if you look at in our case, right, if you say the first two, right? Uh, and even the third one for that matter, but uh, say first two probably are the most used. And absolutely if I'm running say millions and millions of queries of this type, 
I really don't want to use these queries in a strong consistency model in any sense. They don't need absolutely in this case, so it should be straightforward, but uh, you should clearly define. So in case if you have a query which is run one million times to another query which is run only some hundred times, the one which is run hundred times, you could still live with having a strong consistency model for them. But if you try to apply the strong consistency to a one million times query, it clearly affects your overall application performance very badly. So never, never, ever use uh, uh, Cassandra for such kind of an application where your queries are actually require a strong consistency. The most used queries require a con strong consistency model. Okay. So now we'll coming back to our query based modeling. Now we said since we have, we have identified the queries, now we'll try to create a denormalized model. How do we have done is basically we denormalize the existing normal normal or other existing uh, RDBMS structure, removing all the relationships, and then try to accommodate uh, some of those relationships using super column families. Uh, don't really worry about the super column families here. Uh, super column families are used just for understanding sake because it's a lot more easy to visualize a super column family than uh, a composite key. If I if I can give you it here, it'll become a little bit difficult. So. So the super column family is just to say that okay you have information and there is a relationship indirectly between uh, say the other column family and this one. Okay. So looking at this right, so we talked about uh, capability to list hotels by city. So you need a column family. Then you need to get all the hotel information using a hotel ID. So that's from the hotel column family. Similarly, you might need a point of interest information associated with the hotel. So you need a super column family basically you're talking about a hotel ID or the hotel super column hotel super column plus the point of interest uh, point of interest information then something which is related to room room basically says which hotel it is associated with and all the facilities associated with that hotel room is all in one single table then similarly reservation which sort of is relating the the actual reservation person the hotel which his particular book the room he's booked and his arrival, departure, his credit card number, rate, and etc. All information associated with the guest is actually in the reservation table. In events, right? So except for the personal details, which sort of his phone, first name, last name, email, phone, etc. is in, in another guest table. So this, if you look at it, I mean, do you guys think this is like a very streamlined or a proper model in any sense? So if you look at this Cassandra data model, it, it surely is built to serve almost all the queries that we have identified plus some additional queries too. So you could actually get guest information if you want directly all the guests that are there or you want to say get all the reservations that have been made you could get it directly. So all those stuff are available directly from each column family. But the concept very simple is every query that you are making should be served from one single column family. And we are not really talking about relations here, right? So I don't want to go across multiple column families to serve a query. Very important. Okay. So, so this sort of gives is basically serves our request, serves our requirement right now. So what are the problems with this model? Using a lot of super column families, naturally a lot of overhead in the system. Still multiple column families. There are still many column families. No relations, fine, but absolutely there is still scope for optimization. Why do you need a, a separate table for guest? Why do you need a separate table for rooms? Why can't actually all of them be in one place? Okay. We did some separation of concerns wherever we saw okay it's required and etc. Why why should room and room availability should be different? Why can't everything will be in one column family? So there are all basic questions that you will have, right? Why should it be separate? Why can't it, you have everything in one single table? So to answer that, we will actually look at a, a, a more optimized model. And how does it work? So we saw basically if you look at our application, right? So we said what are the various things that it does? It does a hotel search, right? It does hotel listing and then it, had, it provides hotel book details for booking, right? So those are the three important things. Now assume that we look at that thing and try to apply it to our data model. Okay, here we did query based modeling where we said I have set of queries and for each query I will try to build some sort of an entity which will help me to query that 
only from that particular column family. So now coming back to our actual search model, right? So if you look at it, what we had, we had three pages, right? One is the search page, one is the list page, and the other one is more of a details page, right? So search page, what, what, what does it need? Basically, it wants all hotels by city and all information that you would provide in that query is all available from one single table. And when it comes to list, listing the hotel information, all hotels, all hotel details, hotel ID, name, description, rating count, rating average, reviews, POI, amenities, prices, everything could be stored in one, one single table. Why should it be in multiple tables? All details are still with the hotel. But rooms might be different, so that's the reason basically, you see rooms could be like different types, right? You can, some of the room, some of the hotels may support uh, only standard and deluxe. Some of them might actually support standard deluxe, uh, I mean ultra deluxe or rather even suits and etc. So there should be some mapping so because of which we kept hotel rooms still separate here. And then the final page is basically the hotel bookings where you want to show information about the bookings associated with the particular guest. So all hotel room price details the entire booking information, all the guest details, his phone number, his personal data, everything could be in one single table, why should it be in multiple tables? Because Cassandra doesn't limit us from having many columns, right? Make sense? So the, okay, another important thing, this, this doesn't show you all possible columns that you would need, but it's saying that I can have actually four entities, four, day, four tables, so four column families, and I can still serve this application completely. So prices one and two basically could be uh, uh, for different dates or it could be basically some tags where I'm saying uh, uh, price one is applied for uh, say a set of dates in a month because of a particular season or a particular event time. There could be many, many different reasons. So as I said, it doesn't show you all possible columns that you would need for building the application, but it, it, it gives you an idea of that you can serve this application with a set of just four tables and it is in line with how the user perceives it. The user has a search page so all the information associated with the search or just getting the high level listing of hotel IDs could be in one single table and all details associated with the hotel whether it is related to the ratings, the POI, the point of sale or whatever you want information about the hotel could be sitting in just one single table. Okay. Similarly, rooms information could be in one single table and bookings could be in another table. So the basic idea that actually it's trying to show is try and design your model in such a way that you could say I can run multiple queries once from one single column family and never run a query across multiple column families. For instance, I shouldn't be using multiple column families to serve a query. You can increase your column family uh, width, add more number of columns, but try and serve most of the queries, I mean related queries, not really just like that any queries, most of the related queries should be run from as much as possible from a single column family. I wouldn't say it's absolutely possible in every application, but try to reduce that at any time, right? Price could be an array, right? So prices actually could be arrays or they could be multiple columns themselves, right? So you would delete the guest info after the reservation date has passed. Would you need it for future promotional offers? Yes, it might, right? Uh, just it's showing that all the informations are the guest related. Guest information is associated with the bookings. Your bookings are not deleted in any sense, right? Bookings might be there. If you really want to do some sort of uh, intelligent uh, uh, discount applications and etc. You might need to know your bookings information, but it, instead of having the guest information, you could actually store only as a bookings information, right? And you would even if you have a guest information, you already already at any point you would want to know how many days he has stayed in the hotel uh, and how many rooms did he book, what quality of the room is booked before you apply a discount for him or make it more attractive, right? So you should surely be knowing the bookings made by the guest any day. They are all related data, right? 
So putting all of them in one single table is a very straightforward thing. So looking at the actual data structure and types which are there inside Cassandra, so this, sort, this table gives you all the different types of uh, supported data types. It's just basically more of an information of all the different supported data types. So some interesting stuff that you need to look for is uh, it provides you something called a type 1 and type 4 UUIDs. Uh, these are basically like a universally unique UIDs or hashes. Universally unique IDs or hashes, uh, which are again specializedly created for different types of uh, categories. So basically, uh, one big advantage of uh, time UUID is uh, it creates a unique hash for the same timestamp. Even if a record a row key has the same timestamp as your data element, but it's still if all elements are same, even along with the same timestamp. So, for example, you are talking about data coming into a log file, for example, okay? So you have a huge amount of logs and the number of input logs is so high that you might have, uh, say, multiple records in at the level of even for the same millisecond, right? So if you want to write such kind of a data into the Cassandra, you still need a unique ID to represent that data, right? So the time UUID actually helps you to create that. It actually uses multiple randomization parameters. It uses, ran it uses a specialized random seed it uses uh, four different types of parameters actually and based on those four different parameters it generates a hash and because of which the hash that is generated is actually unique even if the timestamp is exactly the same right so that is the uh, biggest advantage so it automatically makes sure that they are absolutely unique so every record that is uh, stored in Cassandra is absolutely uh, is uniquely recognizable using a, a row key so you can use a row key as time UUID in that case so like that it has all different types of other data types ASCII, BIGINT, BLOB. BLOB is an arbitrary type which is uh, again very similar to your BOB BLOBs in, uh, in RDBMS so it provides you uh, different types of conversion mechanisms like just as uh, in Java, uh, whoever is familiar with Java we can, we can actually convert any of your basic types to strings, right? Uh, say int as, int as string and you want to store it or retrieve, you can do that. Similarly, blob also provides you a conversion capability from the other data types to blobs. So as blob or blob as type. So there are two different functions which it provides for you to convert between uh, the actual data types and the blobs itself. So then the others said the counter is basically a 64-bit long counter. Okay, so then double is 64-bit uh, IEEE 7754 floating point, etc. And then varchar, variant, which are again pretty much the uh, similar uh, stuff that you would be there in, uh, that you have seen in RDBMS. Car, int, and etc. Okay. So these are the set of data structures and different types that are supported in Cassandra. So uh, just to look at the history, I mean this is yeah, just to get a feel of how the Cassandra versions have gone through and what are the different types of features that got introduced, it's just more of an, again, a pretty much an information slide. But the initial release which was actually came out of uh, Facebook, Facebook was the first person who actually pushed out this uh, Cassandra as an open source uh, availability into Apache's uh, distribution. So the first version was sort of, I think it's 0.5 or something, 0.5 or 0.6. So 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8 actually introduced uh, support for secondary indexes, integrated caching, map reduce, online schema changes. There was a very basic version of SQL that got introduced and that's way different from what what is available today. So to our, today's stuff is, is much, much better and it, it's a lot more easy for us to manipulate and operate. Uh, then there is uh, self-tuning mem tables mostly to do with the, the storage and etc. associated with that. Uh, 1.0 was probably the most uh, optimized version where you actually looked at uh, compression, compaction, all these things coming in where you are talking about more of optimization of your overall storage, uh, optimizing your read performance, improving the read performance and things like that. 1.1 uh, again had uh, uh, support for mixed SSD and spinning disks and etc. and some self-tuning caches. 
the read write caches that will be there and etc. Uh, the 1.2 probably was the biggest change in the Cassandra model because uh, till 1.2, before 1.2, we were always um, manipulating Cassandra clusters as physical nodes. Right? The physical nodes are sort of the actual members. So 1.2 was probably the biggest revolution actually you should say because uh, till 1.1 uh, we were always talking about the cluster being formed across physical nodes. So the physical nodes are actually the way to form the cluster which means that uh, the partition that you make was always at the level of the physical nodes, the physical entities which are actually forming the cluster. So the partitions are naturally of much bigger size and as a result uh, every failure actually means that you are recovering the entire partition. So that naturally was having an overhead, it has surely had some time to recover and etc. But uh, if from one or two onwards Cassandra introduced what we called as virtual nodes. So it's a very very useful concept and that's something which is default today if you don't really change back to the, the physical model. So now what happens in 1.2 is uh, onwards is Cassandra's individual partition on a physical node, a single partition on a physical node is broken down into 256 default pieces or the default partitions which are virtual partitions you can say. So the node is physical but it, it, its internal partition data which it's responsible for is broken down to 256 small small partitions and this two small small partitions are actually shuffled across the cluster. So advantage is uh, you, are, you, are, you are actually manipulating say about close, if you are talking about four nodes, you are, instead of actually manipulating the data across four partitions, you are manipulating across 1024 partitions. Now the entire data is broken down to 1024 partitions. What's the advantage? Basically now say in case if a particular node is lost, what is lost is the, the amount of small entity which you need to restore is reduced quite a lot in size because, because since it's the entire virtual partitions are actually shuffled across the network, there is no physical dependency in any sense. So and all, all you are dealing with is at the smallest possible level which is the 1, 1 by 256 the size of the partition, right, you are dealing at that level. You just make sure that 1 by 256 size which is that particular one unit of the virtual node that needs to be restored as far as you are concerned. But you'll probably run multiple restorations of small, small pieces which is a lot more easy than actually and a lot more easy and quick than running a, a big, huge partition restoration, right? So that is the way it actually helps a lot. So that's the reason and this number of virtual nodes could be increased if you really want to but the default is 256. Then a lot of improvements were done to gossip, uh, internet communication and etc. So there are specialized uh, atomic bot batches that got introduced in SQL where you can run multiple statements together as a batch kind of a stuff and there is another feature called request tracing which actually tells you how the request actually went through the cluster across the nodes. So when I'm doing a write, what happens basically it goes to one of the nodes who actually coordinates activity and uh, then how the replica synchronization happens between the replicas. So the entire request could be traced as to how it is actually flowing in the cluster. It's a very interesting feature we will actually uh, do this as a demonstration in uh, uh, SQL, the SQL class which is a class number 7. Okay. Then uh, 2.0 actually has experimental stuff like lightweight transactions, triggers and there is some additional improvement on the compactions. Now I will show you something today because uh, we talked about some of those things anyways, right? So that is the different uh, versions of Cassandra. Yeah, another very informative slide is there are multiple different types of commercial versions available there in the market. So the uh, commercial versions are basically I think the most famous or the most popular commercial version, uh, commercial distribution of a Cassandra is data stacks. Uh, and then the next one is somewhat Akunu, there are uh, URA imagination, impetus, I have not used any of this stuff I would say. The only ones which I have heard the most is naturally the data stacks. Data stacks I have used to some extent because I was part of the conferences which the data stacks actually conducts and uh, I have a set of friends who actually work at data stacks themselves. So uh, 
that's probably the reason why I am more a little more closer to data stacks than enables and I've interacted with a lot of people from data stacks because of uh, some specialized things like uh, there's something called Cassandra file system which is actually provided by the data stacks version but not provided in the free version. Uh, so this this actually is again something which uh, the Cassandra file system sort of uh, resembles exactly similar to your HDFS. So you can use CFS as the base for any of your Hadoop installations or Hadoop based uh, map reduce calculations and etc. very easily. So that is the advantage of, uh, uh, so it basically helps you to integrate very easily with your Hadoop applications. And that, but that's available in, in the commercial versions of Cassandra, not in the free version. Data sex provides you. In addition to that, what is the advantage? Why do you, why should you look for commercial versions, right? So in the, in the free free versions, we already talked about it. We, since it's being an open source one, you may not have on-demand patches. You might have actually requested for a patch, but it takes time to come back and things on those lines. But though the Cassandra community is pretty active, so it should be generally very fast. But uh, even uh, but there is no guarantee. That's the difference. So there is no guarantee of uh, an on-demand patch any times, right? So then. Uh, you will get a 24 bar 7 expert support if you have a commercial version. You have specialized management tools. For example, uh, DataStax provides a, a, a management console which helps you to manage your Cassandra cluster easily. Add node, add delete, load balance. So it basically provides a GUI based interface which helps you to control your uh, overall cluster a lot more easily and simply it provides you specialized data integration tools like export import of data back and forth from another system to this one, etc. There are uh, you, you will actually find an open source alternative for each of them, but the onus lies on you in the sense like say it may not work, it might work, and if I you to set it up, build it and set it up yourself, that those things will take time. So that is the difference between the commercial and the non commercial versions. Flexibility of configuration because naturally they provide you some additional uh, stuff over the existing stuff, existing things. Basically, you know, as I said, right? Note will provide you a lot of options on the uh, on the command prompt. But uh, if you if you actually want to run it in a more simpler way, you don't want to really be aware of all the possible commands, the parameters that you can pass, and etc. They provide you a very simple way of doing it using a GUI because the data stacks version provides you that. Okay. And as I said, Hadoop integration, DataStacks only provides because DataStacks provides out of the box uh, Hadoop installation, Hadoop stack actually installed along with the Cassandra stack itself, Cassandra itself. So you could run your uh, Hadoop program directly on uh, DataStacks version of Cassandra. Okay. So that is the advantage of using commercial versions and that's where they actually score over the freeware. So downloading and exa extracting, as I said, I think this is more for the benefit of other people who couldn't install so far. So, uh, so as I said, Apache provides you uh, tarballs and Debian packages. So as I said, Debian actually has a separate installation, but most of the Linux uh, systems as well as the Windows systems actually work with the binary tarballs. So just install one of the binary tarballs, and what is the prerequisite is you should have Java. Uh, 1.5 and above because naturally it's a Java application so you need Java to be installed on your system. Other than that there is nothing else which is actually required in addition to uh, the binary and Java. So there's a basic configuration so these are the set of things which are required. So as I already said right I showed you this in the second class when the practicals. The most important things are the cluster name basically trying to group the multiple nodes into a single cluster and there are other three directories which you need to be modifying appropriately because the default location of these directories is to a root folder which is basically owned mostly by roots in the system the slash var lib cassandra so you could change it to the the user owned directory so that your cassandra instance can run because it it needs a right permission for these directories for the instance so data file directories commit log directory and save cache directories so those are the three directories which you need to modify to the user owned directory so that it will be able to have it the, the instance that you are running will have the right permission to these directories. So if you have updated these four configurations in Cassandra.yaml then you can just run Cassandra using Cassandra-f which is basically run Cassandra in foreground. foreground right? So basically it's saying that you, you create a shell and it will keep it uh, 
it will keep logging all the information that's happening in Cassandra. Okay. So there are three different tools which it provides. SQL SH is basically the shell for running your SQL commands. Cassandra CLI we talked about, and then there is something called we haven't we haven't we have seen it in practice too. But as I said, Cassandra CLI will be going out uh, from 3.0 onwards. We saw that when we are running our practicals, right? It throws up a small warning saying that it will be deprecated. It's a deprecated, and it will go away from 3.0 onwards. It will not support, not be supported. Then a Node tool uh, is another is more of an administration and a monitoring tool used for managing monitoring your uh, Cassandra cluster. Uh, we will use this actually. I'll, I'll use this today to show you how the compaction etc happens inside the Cassandra system. Okay, we will run a, a short a session on that. Okay, so working with key spaces. I mean, this we have already seen. Uh, so. So this is the way to basically create key space, key space hotels, and then drop key space. Uh, some of this is we've already seen, so I'm just skipping very fast, just to show you. So what are the different types? So you can say key blob as primary key. So you can set something as a primary key. You can define uh, comparators. You can define a default validation. But some of these syntax is gone away now, so uh, it needs to be updated. So the other important thing is this one. This is a very useful uh, table. This is talking about all the various properties of a column family that you can set in the configuration. Comparators, we all know the different data types associated with the column names, right? Then a small freeform human readable comment could be provided for a specific column family. Similarly, row cache provider. Cassandra provides you default row caches called uh, Serializing cache provider or concurrent hash map cross provider, so you can use one of them. Uh, it's basically a factory for the cache with which to back the row cache. Then there's something called row cache size. Uh, row cache size is zero. I mean, this actually could be set. These are some of it. All these parameters help in uh, tuning the actual performance of Cassandra. So if you have, say, a lot of memory available, so you'll naturally want to increase your row cache size and key cache size, which will surely improve the overall performance of your uh, system. Number of keys per SS table are kept in memory, in the and it will always be refreshed in the LRU order. Read repair chance, uh, another very important thing, which should be mostly closer to one. Uh, the idea is, say, whenever there is an, uh, whenever there you see a discrepancy, uh, how often can you repair it in in a short time? So this like basically you want to set out and say what is the probability with which the read read repair should be invoked on non quorum reads. We'll talk about what is quorum, non quorum, and all this stuff a little more detailed in our subsequent classes. But uh, uh, so it's like a grouping of a set of nodes and saying uh, when I am actually reading from a cluster, uh, how many nodes are minimum requirement nodes for me to certify that? Uh, my cluster is available and still can provide me the data. So there is some grouping mechanisms, it's called quorum and non-quorums. Uh, so uh, we, we will talk about it, we'll talk about those things in detail. Okay. So in GC gray seconds, it's again something which we know, mainly for uh, cleaning up your tombstones. So in, uh, default validation, so as I said, there is a min compaction threshold and a max compaction threshold. We talked about it yesterday also, right? Min is basically four, and max is 32. These are you can adjust these parameters appropriately to change your uh, compaction thresholds. Uh, and then row cache saved period save period in seconds. So row cache save basically is it it writes that uh, the caches to the disk. So how often does it write? So it's basically the number of seconds. Similarly, key cache save period in seconds. Replica on right, replicate on right. So this is another more to do with. Uh, so it, this is actually, I think, most often than not, it's written. It's 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 true. So you can actually set it appropriately. So it's again durability stuff, durable rights things inside Cassandra. So these are all the various parameters that you could actually control at the column family level configuration actually again, right? 
So again, uh, coming back to working, so what are the different types of column values? It could be a JSON, XML, text, delimited, we talked about collections, right? I can write data in using multiple different types of delimiters, I can write using collections and then you could actually make it a null column too, right? So column values can take any of these data types, okay? Absolutely, this is all more of information, I think more than that. Well, these are all very familiar stuff for you guys anyway, so. This is again a comparison of the internal types, basically providing an internal type and a SQL type. Uh, I'll just keep it on and then you could read it. It's again for different types of com comparators and validators and the data types provided. A lot of information actually, this is more of an information which uh, you will actually start capturing into your mind automatically when you start working with it. Because this is more of information which is useful for probably taking tests, but uh, you wouldn't remember it just for the sake of book, bookie purpose. I would rather say use it uh, and then only you will remember it really well. Uh, SQL, I think since we have introduced the tools, I just wanted to mention here, see that where are the basic operations that are supported by SQL, so it will say select, insert, it, it supports most of the things which you would actually look at in the uh, SQL uh, world and plus additional to that, it provides you some uh, very specific to Cassandra like consistency levels, uh, etc. which is very specific to Cassandra which does not make sense in the RDBMS world. So it also supports multiple different types of libraries, Python, Java, Node.js, Clojure, uh, too many. And you could go to this uh, URL, it talks about uh, the various different types of options that it provides, right? So it provides you the different types of drivers like Python driver, the Java driver, Node.js driver, so you can use one of these depending upon the language that you want to use. Uh, to connect to Cassandra, okay? So, I'm actually using one of them right now. I think more of, uh, I think it's a Python one. So, I'm using a Python driver just to run a, a basic simple Spark based uh, uh, queries into the Cassandra system. So, I actually have a small Python based, uh, it's more of using just open source systems. I have a set of open source libraries that I've used to connect to Cassandra which actually stores logs inside Cassandra and these logs are actually exposed as RDDs in Spark and then I run uh, queries on the Spark to create some analytics information out of the logs. That's a, a simple application that I was trying to do. Uh, Thrift. Thrift is another uh, sort of a dying model to some extent because this was a, a default mechanisms. Uh, TTL is basically time to live. Uh, it's basically again putting some sort of an expiry column, right? It's on an expiry column model. We talked about expiry columns. So TTL is meant to be for that. Which is the mostly used driver in the market. Uh, right now I think if you look at SQL, I think the mostly used one. Uh, so when it comes to most of the client APIs, the mostly used ones are called Hector. And But Hector does not, as far as I know, does not provide a SQL support directly. It provides you basically, it's a Java API, so you could use Java API to connect to the Cassandra cluster, uh, Hector, but I don't know if the new versions of Hector actually support SQL in any sense, but uh, uh, the ones which I've used 1.1.4 1 .1 uh, didn't have a SQL and we used to basically use the general Java API to connect and create uh, uh, key spaces, work with key spaces, insert data and etc. SQL, uh, the support is actually available in, in uh, data stacks drivers, uh, is AstroNX implementation of data stacks. AstroNX is another client, very famous one. Right now it's sort of picking up uh, popularity a lot in the recent times because it again was formed by a community of Hector uh, people itself who actually came out of Hector and uh, uh, started AstroNX implementation. I would say it's again Basically, more like uh, Hector is the ancestor of the data stack. Sorry, Astyanax in a sense. So Astyanax client actually is a uh, uh, provides your SQL library, which works very similar to your SQL libraries. If, you, if anybody has written, say, Java-based SQL queries, you could embed your query directly, SQL query directly into an application API, right? 
So that kind of a support is provided in uh, as an X based uh, SQL uh, driver. So you can actually write a SQL query and uh, run it directly using the uh, as an X API. So such kind of supports are provided. Uh, that makes it very straightforward and easy and uh, since it's it's a very familiarized model for anybody who has worked with Java in the past, at least with SQL systems, uh, it makes it very easy for them to work with even Cassandra. Okay. So the thrift, uh, thrift is basically the was the default or the uh, most common way of uh, providing a client interface to uh, Cassandra. So it's a default internally provided driver for communication to Cassandra. But the the biggest problem was thrift was uh, it just never kept uh, uh, going in line with the developments in Cassandra. So Cassandra was actually adding more and more features. But thrift was very complex, so people didn't really develop the thrift uh, at the same pace as Cassandra. So it was always uh, running behind, and it never supported all the new features which were there in Cassandra. So as a result, uh, the importance actually there's a lot of difficulty in using thrift. That's the problem. So it is a basically a driver level uh, support, which means that the the application has the onus, the client application has the onus of managing the protocol, the transport at the base level. Uh, it's almost like that you are going through all layers of uh, the protocol yourself and making sure that you are managing it by yourself. Uh, if you look at the base socket communication, right, a socket client and a socket server, you would you actually tell, right, so in, in any Unix socket based uh, client server communication, you say you use TCP, you send this kind of uh, reusable parameters, you actually send the configuration of your socket descriptor, you, you do everything all by yourself. So that makes it very difficult to, to use the base level socket programming and that's something which is uh, very comfortable with only some sort of uh, very closely uh, using people who actually wants a very, do, they don't want to use application level stuff but they want to have a full control on the communication that's happening at the base level. Those kind of people actually use it and not really the general programmers. So Thrift is also on a similar lines where it is it provides a lot more those those difficulties with respect to managing the protocol, the transport, and etc. for communication between your client and the Cassandra server. Actually, uh, building a Thrift adapter itself is a very very tough job. I actually have it built. I can show it on my screen maybe in the subsequent class because I think we don't have too much time today, but we will do it anyways. So I'll show you the Thrift uh, built out of it where I could generate a language specific bindings. So I could generate language specific bindings which is like a language proxy on the client side in a sense, right? So if, if, if any of you guys have ever worked with distributed programming like Corba and all, you basically have something called an um, uh, basically called something called an IDL, an interface definition language. So you write your interface which uh, is your communication between your servers and the uh, client uh, protocol and then you generate proxies. You generate the uh, client side proxy and then the server side uh, proxies for them to communicate. Very similar to RMI and if anybody who is familiar with RMI also might be knowing this, right? So you have a client side proxy and a, and a server side proxy and then uh, you do basically marshalling of the request and unmarshalling of the request before it goes to the server. Server services your request and sends back the response again response goes through the same model of marshalling and marshalling and the client takes the uh, response out and then uh, process it appropriately. So this entire cycle actually happens uh, in the uh, RMI or even the CORBA based systems and very similar stuff actually happens in, in the thrift world. So it actually generates a proxy for you which you will use to connect to the server and get your work done. So you create an interface very similar to an IDL and then you run the, uh, the thrift adapter on that to generate the language specific bindings. You want a Python or you want a Java or you want whatever you want. You can sp specify that language and it will provide you an appropriate binding for that uh, language and then you can comfortably uh, use it to communicate to Cassandra. Okay, so we'll do some practical. So I'll show you how the thrift works and what kind of uh, adapter it generates uh, for language specific things because I have a thrift built and Building thrift uh, from it has to be done always from source, so it's very very a tedious job. It takes about a few hours to make sure that you build thrift because and it has a lot of dependencies. So you have to dip, download Boost libraries. You download uh, a couple of other libraries called libconf, 
and etc. So build all these libraries first, and then over the using those libraries actually build the thrift binary from source code. So that takes uh, so the entire compilation building of that takes a few hours. I think it took about two and a half three hours for me. And the only advantage that I had is I was having a Linux or an Apple or a MacBook. If you do it on Windows, I mean I just can't imagine because you need base Python and lots of other things before it actually builds. Python and etc. are default in Linux, so nowadays, so it's a lot more straightforward for me and uh, uh, I could download the dependent packages and things very easily compared to what probably a Windows based system does. So building uh, the thrift on Windows might be a little difficult, but uh, on Linux it was straightforward at least in my case because uh, I took about a couple of hours or rather two, three hours or something to build thrift adapter. Yeah, then it takes time to resolve the dependencies, but other than that the actual compilation and deploying it takes about a couple of hours. Okay. So the thrift is uh, works on the similar on that line, and where it also supports multiple different languages. Languages, uh, so Haskell and etc. If you look at it here, it talks about how do you actually build it. So if you see my screen right now, it provides you the different types of language adapters which are available for Cassandra, Thrift, Java, Asgenax is here. If you see, this is again actually something that's uh, developed at Netflix. And one of the popular ones, and Hector is another one which is very popular, as I said. Hector and Astyanax are probably the most popular ones as of now in the industry. There's still a lot of them which are used out by people, but uh, these are the most popular ones. Then uh, each of them, again, each language has their own uh, uh, specialized adapters which you could use, clients, basically. Okay, the client libraries. The Cassandra PHP client library, similarly, there will be something for Perl. And, uh, C++, Haskell, Erlang, Go. So again, if you see, there are many clients available for the popular ones. So for example, in the case of Java, there are many clients available, if you see here, right? Because that's the most popularly used uh, language. The reason being is Cassandra itself is uh, a Java application. I'm using PyCasa here, which is a Python-based Cassandra libraries for connecting to my Cassandra. Okay. Uh, so that is what it is, and then uh, looking at Thrift, Thrift supports all these things, and then uh, this actually gives you some more information on how to build the Thrift and etc. if you really want to look at it, okay? This is just a basic code, just to give a feel of what it is and how does it look and etc. And then the three different uh, mechanisms of creating a database, the Cassandra CLI, SQL SH, and the YAML or JMX based uh, a mechanism to create the uh, key space. So you could create it in three different ways. One is Cassandra CLI, which we have already seen in practice. SQLSH we will see again in our class. We will work a lot in SQLSH. And then YAML and JMX is another way of doing the same thing. Okay, so another very important thing, so which we wanted to cover about today. Because say whenever I'm creating a column family, I surely want to decide how it should be structured, right? Say, in, in our case, when we said, right, we, we wanted to, say, list the hotel IDs. Now, you want to store the hotel IDs as multiple ways, right? You could store the hotels as a delimited text or a string of hotel IDs, or you could store it as, say, columns. What is the purpose? How does it, how do you decide what is the right way to storage? Right way to store it, because both can serve your queries, right? So an example basically to be is is to look at is this one. So as you you are you are actually storing hotels by city, right? In this case, the hotels by city is, can actually be served by both the tables, table number one and table number two, right? Or rather, column family one, column family two. Which is useful? Which is the right way to store it? Can anybody guess? So actually, if you look at it, right, both have their advantages and disadvantages. So what makes a sense for you, you can use it that way. So assume that uh, you are adding your hotels very, very frequently. Okay, so you're adding more hotels on a regular basis, then what would have is, in the first case, it's basically going all into the same column. So your schema is not changing drastically, right? So the application wise, you actually pull out a list of hotels and show this list of hotels. And the list might be like, say, have two or ten, right? 
you just iterate through the list and show. So you are absolutely no changes to the application by adding more hotel information. So assume that in the case of second case where you can add more columns, right? So when you're adding more columns, naturally you need to know that your range of columns that you want to query. You could as well do it here also in a way they're saying that, okay, give me uh, all HID 1 to HID 15. So you can say all columns from HID 1 to 15. And you may not, you might have only say 5 or 10 hotels now, but it can be served when you are increasing the board number of hotels automatically. So there is multiple ways. So question is, what makes sense for your application? What is the right way? Say if you are doing any queries very specific to the hotel IDs, say you want to look at a hotel ID and say, okay, I want to know all information associated with hotel ID 4 with respect to all cities, example. I mean, so the second query, second table is more, more efficient or more is better for managing such kind of queries. But if you are actually doing something like, okay, uh, give me something like, uh, say, you are manipulating more at the group of hotels and you are really not dealing with the individual hotels in any sense, right? So if you are not dealing with the individual hotels in your queries, then the top uh, table, the, the table number one would be better, right? So that's important. What I'm saying is, uh, if you look at it, what I'm trying to say is, if your queries actually deal with individual hotel IDs, then the second table is always better. But if your query is agnostic to the individual hotel IDs and you're always worried about the collection associated with the city, you would use the first table. So that's the best way. So basically you have to be very, uh, you have to take all things into consideration before you choose one over the other. What type of queries that you're running, depending upon that one, you choose the one over the other. Similarly, we want to say create uh, hotel details. So what is the key here? Hotel ID plus what? Anything else or just hotel ID? Naturally fixed and dynamic because it's a time series data. So storing the hotel ID could be something like this, hotel details. Okay. So if somebody was talking about a day-wise data, day-wise price and etc. for a hotel uh, specifically, right? So you can store it something like this. So if you look at the column number 10, the, the one which is with the date, it has a specialized structure in which it stores. Uh, this is basically could be a delimited information or it could be a collection by itself. So if if, if, if Hotel Taj Vivanta has uh, say many rooms and of different different prices, you could say R1190 USD and it's basically a collection of these structures. Okay, R1190 USD, R2200 USD, R3500 uh, USD could be the three is a set of three different values that could be written as a column value of 10th November itself. What is the advantage? You have grouped everything related to the hotel into one single table. So I got, uh, it basically has a room one, which is of 190 and the currency is US dollars. The who, who's, who responsibilities? Now application has a responsibility to obtain this structure and uh, process it accordingly. So basically use the call caller as a delimiter, obtain the room, new room information, obtain the price and obtain the currency and then calculate the appropriate price accordingly. So when you store collections or when you store uh, this kind of delimited structures, the onus lies on the application. But it gives an advantage. It is the, it's, all, it's completely avoiding my, uh, it, it completely avoiding my super column family needs in any sense, right? So if I store structures like this, it completely avoids my super column needs. So another, imp another very useful thing. So now we have done is uh, basically the device uh, rates for the particular total and the types of rooms that are available. So the next one was basically we talked about hotel rooms. Why would we need hotel rooms? So assume that I have a, another very simple way, right? So each hotel room, we are actually associating a price with it in the earlier table. Now I need to know information about the particular price calculation, how it's been calculated. Because uh, as, as you guys know, who are actually living in US, might know that the state-wise tax are different, right? So somebody in California pays a very higher tax, but compared to a person who's, who's living in Texas. 
So your taxes actually automatically vary. Though the base cost is say 100 USD, based on the taxes, the automatically the overall price of the room actually goes up or goes down. So taking that into consideration, there are several uh, other things that you need to really justify when you're calculating the cost of your room. So in this case, if you look at it, I have a composite key, which is basically the hotel ID and then the room one in the hotel rooms table because uh, each hotel ID will have its own type of rooms, right? And it might be, all of them might be called with the same one. Say 100 might have a standard and deluxe and similarly 102 might also have a standard, 200 might have a standard and deluxe too. So they all of them have their own uh, very similar kind of categories though, right? So you have a composite key which is uh, 100 hyphen R1 and then the calculation associated with each of the price associated with that hotel for a specific day in line with the calculation. So the B, the top of the B basically says it's base price 100 USD and T at the bottom says tax 20 USD. And probably some additional information for you to calculate the overall price of the hotel for that particular day. So this is like the hotel rooms information where you are trying to give more specifics about the actual price calculation. Composite data, composite keys, making sure that you avoid the super column families completely. Okay, and then use of collections. Now coming to hotels, it's just populating the data, so it's giving you some code snippets here. So you can say something called get or create cluster, which actually allows you to connect to the cluster. And then um, you say create key space, basically connects to the key space, existing key space. Key space should be always available. There's something called create key space definition. So when you do create key space definition, it really creates a key space. So which means that you can actually create a key space directly from your code. The key space need not exist already in the database itself. So it provides you key space definition, column family definition where you could actually create key spaces and column families. But it does not have a create cluster definition. So cluster should be existing already. So it exists in cluster, it connects to and does all these things. So if you look at it, I think a very interesting stuff if you see, say something called uh, set read CF consistency level, set write CF consistency level. So you could actually set the consistency level in your code before you do a read or write into your key space or column family. You can do it even at the command prompt. When I'm running queries, I can say consistency level of this one and it automatically changes the consistency level in line with what you want and then it will do the write for you. So that's a very nice advantage. You can change your consistency as, uh, as required before you write the data into the database. Okay. Uh, similarly, hotel details, another interesting one, uh, which is also showing a pretty much the same case, creates key space and mutates. Mutator is basically uh, co connecting multiple queries into one and then you can execute everything at one shot. So you are actually seeing all your insertions all at one shot and then say mutator.execute, which executes all these queries at the same time. So it provides you this uh, capability inside your uh, the client, H Hector Factory. H Factory is nothing but the Hector Factory. Uh, so H Hector Factory provides you that capabilities, uh, uh, API to do that. Okay. So then uh, hotel rooms, uh, how do you, if you look at it here, the data is basically a collection. A base rate, taxes, total, currency, these are all a, it's a set. It's a set of information that's being stored in the column as the value. Uh, we will deal with all these sets, uh, the lists and maps which the Cassandra actually provides. We will do a lot of practicals on that in our uh, SQL class. So we'll do a lot of practicals on how do you read, write, how do you actually remove a column of column value from the map or add a column val uh, value to a map. We will do all the stuff, okay? So let's not really worry about it. This is just to give a feel of how the data will be stored and what is the reason behind storing it as a collection or as a, a delimited text and how what is the onus on the application. So the more, uh, when you store anything as a comma separated or a delimited text, the onus on the application increases more because our, our application has to retrieve everything as one single set and do all the processing for you. Do the separation of the data and etc. So whatever is more convenient and what makes more sense for your application, 
we should actually use it appropriately. Either use delimited text or have all of them as columns. Okay. Similarly, we 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 have seen this, right? The get the get and set of uh, Cassandra CLI. So we have seen it. How does actually it work? The column family name, the key name, and then the actual column name. Uh, similarly, data retrieval. It says has something called a multi slice get get slice queries, multi get slice queries. So you can actually run a multi get slice query and then set the columns that you really want. It's called the keys. Set keys, which is in the second uh, snippet of the box that is shown in the screen. Uh, there's something called set column family, set keys, and set range. So you can set all the columns that you want uh, data for and then you can set a range what is the number of range of rows that you want to look for and then run the query you will get the result set and then browse through the result set to get the individual data 